find it encouraging to hear from those who have just returned from mission. Encouraging to hear their stories. Encouraging to hear all that God is doing around the world. Because we've got to realize, we are just one little small cafeteria. We're just one little small gathering of something that's taken place on Sunday morning, like a wave wrapping the globe in every time zone, in every country, people are gathering. Some in big auditoriums, some in small huddles to worship. We're a part of that. You're a part of that. And we need to celebrate that together. It's an awesome reality. Yesterday, my family and I uh, had the privilege of going to Lion Country Safari. I don't know how many of you have journeyed up to Palm Beach to visit that. It's, it's quite exciting, uh, so long as the rhinoceroses are running the other direction. We had a brief moment of increased heart rate as they started kind of banging into each other nearby. Thankfully, we were not the closest car. Uh, the car didn't come back with any more damage than it's already got, so we're, we're get, we did well. But what I found fascinating is the CD that they give you. They give you a little CD to pop in your CD player or cassette player if you've got an older car. I don't think they've got MP3s yet that they hand out. Uh, but they, they give you this little CD, and you're supposed to hit the go button as you cross into each one of the, the different preserves that they have. And it gives you a description of the animals that you'll see. It says, you know, you'll probably notice this one. It's got this type of antler or horn. It's shaped like this. It grows up to such and such a number of pounds. It's got this type of striping or, or this is unique about this animal. And what I found is that if you pay attention to the description, it's pretty easy to figure out which animal they're pointing to. Without the description, I walk in and say, wow, they got a bunch of deer in here. <laughs> but with the description, you see all the different unique characteristics you know, description of an animal is very helpful if you're trying to identify it. You want to know what it looks like. You want to know the sounds it makes. Perhaps it's normal activity where you would normally see it. What it typically is about. What it's doing. You know, the, the common phrase, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, probably is a, a duck. A chicken. No, no. It probably is a duck. Here today... As we look into the scripture, Mark chapter 9, we're getting a glimpse, a testimony, if you will, of who Jesus is. We're getting to see him in all of his splendor, in all of his glory. And we're getting to recognize in one of the few places that paints it in this vivid manner, the glory of of our King. We're in Mark chapter 9, verses 2 through 8. And I want to set the scene for you because where we are in the Gospel of Mark is very critical to Mark's storyline, the way that the Gospel writer is laying this out. He, remember, he began in Mark chapter 1 with the opening verse declaring that G, this is the, the Gospel of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. And he's going to take that couplet that he is the Christ, the Son of God, and he's going to work that both at the beginning in the middle, where we are right now, and at the end. And as we walk through, it's going to see that this book naturally divides into two halves. This is the main theme that Mark is after. Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God. In fact, if you look, uh, let me just read it for you. The words will be on the screen. Mark chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And then in verse 9, 10 and 11, verse 10 and 11, this is Jesus' baptism. When he came up out of... Out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opening, the Spirit descending on him like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. We see this pattern again in Mark chapter 8, verse 29. And he, that's Jesus, asked them, But who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, we looked at this just a couple weeks ago, You are the Christ. Fast forward to our passage for today, chapter 9, verse 7. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. And we go to the end of the book, in chapters 14 and 15. Chapter 14, as Jesus is standing trial, verses 61 and 62. 
Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And then verse 15, as Jesus breathed his last, chapter 15, verse 39. And when the centurion who stood facing him saw in this way that he breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Do you see Mark's point? Do you see what picture he's painting for us? Do you see... What Mark is saying to you this morning, Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God. And we are at that critical watershed moment in the Gospel of Mark, in that central portion where he is transitioning from the life and ministry, the miracles of Jesus, to Jesus marching to Jerusalem to the cross. We've hit that turn. And Mark is continuing to point us that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Today we look at the transfiguration. Fairly well-known passage in the Bible, but if you're like many, at least here in America, the time to sit and think on a passage like this has not been spent. So I want us to meditate for a few moments together, just on these few short verses, as we see the transfiguration of our King Jesus. If you have a Bible, I encourage you to open up to Mark chapter 9. I'm going to read for us verses 2 through 8. Mark chapter 9, beginning verse 2. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared with, to them Elijah and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly... Looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. This is the word of the Lord. The main point I want you to see is very plain, straightforward today. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. The story is fascinating. Jesus has had this dialogue as they're, as they're traveling on the road. He's talked to them. He's asked the questions, who do people say that I am? And they say, John the Baptist, Elijah, one of the prophets. Who do you say that I am? And Peter steps up and says, you are the Christ. And then Jesus begins teaching them that the Christ himself is going to have to go to Jerusalem, be rejected, suffer, die, and then rise again. And Peter pulls him aside and says, that's, that's, that's not our idea. You, you, you're, you're really messing up the public relations end of this thing. You need to find a different message because people want the Christ to do something else. Jesus rebukes Peter, one of the strongest rebukes we have from the lips of Jesus. Get behind me, Satan. And then he goes on and he, say, he amplifies it by saying, if you want to follow me, you need to deny yourself, take up your cross, and come after me. We saw this a few weeks ago as we walked through that passage. The radical call of, this, of, this, of what it is to follow Jesus. And about a week later, six days, the text, text tells us, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John. Notice how he hadn't given up on, on Peter yet. Hadn't given up on Peter. That's important for us to recognize. He takes them up to a mountaintop. This is not unusual because Jesus often would go to mountaintops to pray. He would find seclusion at night, go to the mountaintop to pray. It's not the first time that he's called these three aside. And it won't be the last. He, he's often pulled these three. These are the inner core with Jesus, Peter, James, and John. And they go up to the mountaintop, but this night would be different. For Jesus was going to be transfigured. Not a word we use every day. Quite literally, it means to change form. It's, it's the word metamorphose. It's, we get metamorphosis out of this idea. It's the, literally the idea of changing form. The text tells us that he began to supernaturally shine forth. His clothes became radiant, intensely white, whiter than anyone could bleach them. 
In other words, this was not a natural, oh, you got a new robe, okay, nice. This was not what was taking place. Jesus, on the mountaintop, in the dark, began shining forth. Blast, brilliant blast of light coming out of his face and off of his clothes, out of who he is. Radiant. Glorious. Can you see the three disciples? Can you see this? Am I just tired? With, with, can, can you see the disciples trying to, trying to process this live stream? I mean, this, this is not photo effects. This is not something that they're watching on YouTube. This is, this is live. They're standing there, and they're trying to grasp what is going on here. This is Jesus, who we just had supper with a few minutes ago. He's been in the boat fishing with us. We've been creeped out by a few things he's done, but we've never seen this. As if this wasn't enough. Then all of a sudden, two individuals are standing with Jesus. Moses and Elijah come and stand next to Jesus, wrapped in Jesus' glory. Now, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm curious, I'm inquisitive. I look at this and I'm saying, how did they know it was Elijah and Moses? Did they like, did Jesus like do introductions? All right, guys, let me introduce you to Moses. Let me introduce you to, I mean, I, were they wearing name tags? I, they obviously had never seen them before. And Peter, James, and John were not that old. But somehow they knew, by the grace of God, that this was Moses and Elijah. And they're standing, and Jesus is talking with, with Moses and Elijah. And you, you can picture three disciples kind of standing there, part of the circle, kind of watching, listening. But yeah, uh, how can you jump into that conversation? Don't worry, Peter will he'll keep, he'll relieve that stress in just a moment. But what were they talking about? to be a fly on the wall. Thankfully, Luke's account gives us the fly on the wall perspective because Luke tells us that they were discussing Jesus' exodus with Moses, the king of the exodus. They were discussing Jesus' exodus. Some translations say departure. I think the word exodus is intentional there, though, because they're discussing the exodus of Jesus, what's about to happen. You can almost hear Jesus talking to them, saying, hey, guys, it's all going down here pretty soon. He's leaning over with Elijah and with Moses, saying, this is what you were waiting for. It's just over the horizon. We're heading there now. This is what was promised. This is what you were longing to see. And then Peter, true to form, opens his mouth. You know, I, some people are nervous eaters. We've met, they get nervous, they just start munching. It's like, you get nervous, you gotta eat something. I think Peter was a nervous talker. Honestly, because the verse right after we hear what he says, says that he was terrified because he didn't know what to say. He didn't know what to say. He was terrified, so he just starts talking. He says, Jesus, it's, it's good that we're here. He's trying to be positive. He's not trying to wreck the scene, although he does in royal fashion. He's trying to be positive. It's good that we're here. And he says, Let, let's, let's, let's build some tents. One for Jesus and, and, and one for Elijah and one for Moses. Let's, let's build some tents. Good idea, right? Or you think he's completely off his rocker. Remember, the tent is the image of the tabernacle. Peter's thinking worship. He's thinking the glory of what Moses initially established. Moses is here, tabernacle. Hey, we can build some tents. I know a great guy who makes tents. Let's build them. Let's set this up on this mountain. It's going to be awesome. That's what Peter's thinking. Can't you see James and John wincing? Peter. Peter, don't do that. Peter, stop talking. Can't, can't you see them kind of wincing as they hear Peter go on and on and, and, and talk about his idea? But Mark is recounting Peter's, Peter's memories, Peter's accounts. Mark and Peter were very close in Peter's later days. And so you, you get the, the, the full understanding that Peter realized he didn't know what he was talking about. He was terrified. He did not know what to say, and evidently no one had taught him to say nothing. But God in his grace overshadowed Peter. God came in his cloud. Not the first time in the Bible we've seen God in the cloud. Again, remember the story of Moses, the people of Israel. 
He overshadows them and says to them, declares to them, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. Rough translation. Peter, bad idea. It's all about Jesus. Follow him. Then the cloud disappears. And they're left standing there with Jesus. Just like it was when they woke up. It's an amazing story. It's an awesome glimpse into the true nature of who King Jesus is. I want you to see this morning that Jesus is the Son of God. And I want you to see three witnesses from this passage, three testimonies from this passage that validate, that display that Jesus is the Son of God. First, the glory of Jesus declares that he's the Son of God. Look at verses 2 and 3 again. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them and his clothes became <laughs> radiant, intensely white as no one on earth could bleach them. Philippians 2, recounting Jesus' coming down to earth, tells us that in humility, Jesus emptied himself and took the form of a servant. For 33 years, Jesus has been keeping this disguise, if you will, wrapped on. He'd been take, he'd taken on the form of a servant. And we'd seen his glory come out in the miracles and come out as he taught in ways that, that boggled the minds of people. And they would say to one another, we've never seen anyone who talks like this. We've never seen anyone teach with this authority, with this power. Can you imagine the furniture that he made as carpenter? Just saying, he is God. And I imagine what he made was pretty pretty impressive but here in this moment it's almost as though Jesus relaxes it's almost as though he lets down his guard for a moment he relaxes for a moment having taken on this this taking on you out of humility this this human guard and it, it's as though he relaxes and the glory of God just naturally just bursts forth out of his being the glory explodes out and this is clearly a supernatural radiance. It's echoes of what Mark prepped us for in verse 1. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, there is some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Remember, Mark ties Jesus and the kingdom of God necessarily together. You cannot have the kingdom without Jesus. You cannot have Jesus without the kingdom. They come together. And he says it's going to come with power. Some standing here are going to see it. And Peter, James, and John, six days later, are standing on a mountaintop watching the power and the glory of God radiate from King Jesus. And that night made such a profound impact on the three disciples that it takes center stage in every gospel account. Matthew records it. Mark records it. Luke records it. And John, while he does not record the transfiguration, says this as a center point in his introduction in John chapter 1. John chapter 1, verse 14. And the word, speaking of Jesus, became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. You can guarantee that John, when he penned those words, was remembering this night. John, when he penned those words, was remembering walking up that mountain, bleary-eyed in the dark, and all of a sudden seeing Jesus change forms before his eyes. Begin to glow, shine, radiate. You know, little children have struggled to keep secrets, right? If you've ever been around a little child with a secret, it's, you don't want to tell them the secret until you're ready for others to know the secret. Because they struggle to keep the secret hidden. Because not only will they try to keep it hidden, but they'll tell you that they're trying to keep it hidden. It's like, I have a secret. Okay, what is it? I can't tell you, but it's about your birthday. Yeah. Eventually it comes out because they struggle to hold it in. They, they can't contain the idea that they know something that's exciting for someone else. They, they can't contain it. It's almost as Jesus, though, here, has let the cat out of the bag. 
He's, he's revealed the secret that he's been carrying for 33 years. But unlike a little child where it's somewhat accidental that they share the secret, with Jesus it's not an accident. Nothing is an accident with Jesus. Jesus is revealing his true, full nature. He is God. When he says that he is, he is the Son of God, it means that he is God the Son. And we get here a glimpse of the Trinity. A glimpse of the second person of the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And I don't stand up here pretending to understand all the Trinity. I don't stand up here pretending to be able to explain all of it. But basically the best way that you can understand it is in the Trinity, you have one God in three persons. There are three who's to the Trinity, and there is one what. We serve one God, and he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And here we see the marvelous glory of God being revealed in God the Son. Marvel at this reality. Jesus is both God and man. We do not sing and worship merely a man. Rather, we praise the God who took on our flesh. It's not some special effects trick. You know, I'm... 35 now. For some of you, that seems really young. For some of you, that seems really old. I get it. It's okay. But I have experienced at least a few times my jeans getting tighter than they should. Had to go up a size. Won't get any more graphic than that. But, you know, the, the older jeans, I could get them on if, if I squeezed in my gut, pulled it around, and, you know, fasten it. Just, so long as I hold it in, we're okay. But if, but if I relax, the pressure on that button might get too strong. Jesus here, you can picture it. He's wrapped himself in human skin. Wrapped himself in our flesh, and he's been holding it. He's been walking as a servant. And for this brief moment, it's almost as though he exhales. And that button just goes flying off. It's almost as though he exhales. And his glory comes radiating. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. said this, verse 18, and we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is spirit. And then in verse 4, he, he clarifies what he means by beholding this glory. Because down in verse 6 he says, For God who said, Let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. So here it is. The glory of Jesus. As we behold and see that glory, that which was transfigured Change for metamorphosis with they. We too are transformed, same word, by beholding his glory. That's how transformation takes place, is when we, through the eyes of faith, see Jesus for who he really is. Do you want to see change in your life? Do you want to see transformation in the lives of your friends, in the lives of your family? Show them Jesus and pray they have eyes of faith to see it. When you read your Bible, look to see Jesus. In Jesus we see the glory of God and it is only there that true, lasting tra transformation can take place. Study Jesus, read the Gospels again and again and again. His glory is your good. Look in awe at King Jesus. He is God come to earth. 
look to him and be changed. Jesus' glory demonstrates that he is the Son of God. The second witness. We see in verse 4. <clears throat> and there appeared to them Elijah with Moses. And they were talking with Jesus. Elijah and Moses. Moses being the one who, through whom God gave the law. Elijah being one of the greatest of all the prophets of God. The law and the prophets testify that Jesus is the Son of God. The law and the prophets testify that who Jesus is and what he is doing is it reflects, it demonstrates that he is the Son of God. Moses was the one through whom God gave the law to the people of Israel. And the law demanded sacrifice for deliverance. Elijah was the prophet of God who did battle on the top of the mountain with the false prophets of Baal. And yet as the prophets who foretold that the Messiah would suffer to bring deliverance, as indeed was the life of Elijah. Luke chapter 24 shines some light on this. Luke chapter 24, verses 40, beginning in verse 44, Jesus, after the resurrection, was appearing to the disciples, teaching them. We pick up in verse 44, and he, that is Jesus, said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be. Be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, Thus is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you. But stay in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. In other words, what Jesus is saying is that in him, the Old Testament is entirely fulfilled. All of the promises, all of the prophecies, all of the hopes of deliverance are fulfilled in Jesus. The Old Testament is far more than simply moral guides and ancient stories. A lot of times we want to read the Old Testament just to figure out, you know, what's, what's the best way to eat? What's the best way to live my life? What's the best way to do this? What's the best way to do that? But the reality is all of the Old Testaments, as Jesus is saying, and as we see exemplified through Elijah and Moses on the mountain that night with Jesus, is that Jesus is the focal point of the Old Testament. Jesus, as the Son, fulfilled all the law and the prophets, the promises of God are fulfilled in Jesus. As you read the Old Testament, read with an eye to Jesus. Marvel at how perfectly Jesus fulfills all that was longed for. Everything that was anticipated, foreshadowed, promised, Jesus came to fulfill it all. Your right standing before God. It's not based upon how well you keep the Ten Commandments. It's based upon your faith in Jesus. Because the law and the prophets say, this is what God demands. And we look at that and every one of us says, I don't measure up. I can't do that. I can't keep that. I'm not good enough. That's exactly why Jesus came. Because you're not good enough and I'm not good enough. We needed a savior. We needed a rescuer, which is what the prophets promised. That while we stand before our maker, hopeless and helpless, to please him, to make our lives right on our own, he would send one who would come perfectly as promised, who would live perfectly, never breaking God's law, fulfilling every promise ever made, and that he would die in The heart of the gospel is found in the fact that Jesus fulfilled the law and the prophets. He fulfilled all that's needed for you to stand right before your maker. We do not stand before God saying, God, I did pretty good this week. If we did that, he would say, yeah, but that's still pretty bad. We stand before God saying, I can't. But Jesus did. 
Moses led the people out of bondage in the first exodus. Elijah was promised to come again to restore all things. This is the heart of the gospel. Jesus died and rose again, accomplishing everything needed for you to stand right before God. Here we see Jesus, the leader of the second and final great exodus for the people of God, who has come bringing the full and final restoration for those who trust in him. His merits secure your freedom. The law and the prophets testify that Jesus is the Son of God because he's doing exactly what they require. The third testimony, the voice of God. Look at verse 5 through 8. And Peter said, Jesus... Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. Ever been in that perfect moment and suddenly been interrupted? You know, my dad tells a story often that uh, he could never lay in the hammock behind our house growing up without being spotted. Because we loved to get in the hammock, especially when dad was outside, because he could push it in such a way where it would flip all the way around. It was fantastic. But that meant anytime he was outside and the hammock was strung up, we wanted to be in with him pushing. And he would get in there on Sunday afternoon, as most of you are probably looking to relax on a Sunday afternoon. He would get there on a Sunday afternoon and he would stretch out, perhaps with a book or perhaps with a pillow just to take a nap in the hammock outside. And as soon as he got in the hammock, it was like an alarm went off. And all the kids from the surrounding houses would say, hey, dad's in the hammock. And we'd all come running and he'd have to get out and we'd get in. Eventually the hammock broke because we got too big and he you know, continued to push us all the way around. Spoiling that perfect moment. That's kind of what Peter did. James and John are sitting there in awe, in silence. Peter opens his mouth and says, hey, let's build some tents. Again, Peter is not malicious in this. But we see the hand of God's gracious mercy as he covers them with this cloud and then corrects their thinking. Take comfort in the mercy of God. Because how often have our ideas and our thinking been so far off the rails that we, we didn't deserve that gracious mercy and correction of God, but he gives it to God has given you his word to guide you in your thinking, to help us think rightly about him and about all things. But the voice of God echoes what we heard in the baptism of Jesus, identifying Jesus as the beloved son. Jesus is the only one who enjoys this place and position. This is important for us to recognize. There's a sense in which every person is the son or daughter of God because he is their maker. There's a broad sense in which that applies, but there's an even greater sense in which that applies to Christians. Because Christians are called adopted sons and daughters, brought into the family of God. There's a special place there, but there is only one beloved son. There is only one who is the son of God in that way. It's a place of primacy. It's a place of authority. It's a place of honor. The weight of Jesus' unique role as God the Son gives weight to the second clause that God gives us there in verse 7 when he says, listen to him. God is speaking directly to Peter, James, and John here. And he says, this is my beloved Son. Listen to him. I don't know that they needed that further instruction. They had just seen Jesus transfigure before them. They had just seen radiant glory shining from his face and out of his fingers. And, and they would just been amazed and wowed at King Jesus. And just to make sure they got the message, God says, make sure you listen to him. Make sure you listen to him. Jesus is the authority, authoritative voice. It's important for us to recognize because there's a lot of voices clamoring for authority in our world today. 
There are a lot of voices in your life that are clamoring to be your authority. And there are levels of authority, levels of, of, of obligation. Jesus himself says, render honor to whom honor is due. But there is only one beloved son from the Father. And he is the ultimate authority. He is our ultimate voice of authority. It is his word that must be heeded. Remember, also, Jesus had just been speaking about what it meant to follow him. And so this call would have come perhaps with a lump in their throat saying, okay, we're going to listen to him, but he just told us we need to pick up a cross to follow him. Jesus calls you to listen and obey his voice. To follow him. To believe the gospel is to obey Jesus. If you are not obeying Jesus, you are not believing the gospel. That's an important connection that we need to recognize. I'm not saying perfectly, because none of us are perfect this side of heaven. But the reality is, if you are not obeying the voice of Jesus, or seeking to obey the voice of Jesus, or grieved in your spirit when you realize you're not obeying the voice of Jesus, then you're not believing the gospel. The gospel is more about a change of direction than a simple decision. So are you following Jesus today? Are you obeying his word? Are you living his way rather than your own? The voice of God confirms that Jesus is the son of God. And that same voice has called you to listen to him. To follow him. To obey him. What voice are you listening to today? God has spoken through his son. His son is Jesus. And every one of us is called to listen. Here on this mountaintop, Jesus let out his glory for a brief yet powerful moment. What baffles my mind is that Jesus would soon go to the cross. And this same glory that he let out on this mountaintop could have been let out at any moment during the scourging, during the crucifixion, during the trial, just to say, see, I told you. He didn't do it. He did not allow himself to relax and reveal his true divine glory. But yet in restraint, held it back even on cross. He humbled himself. He wrapped himself in flesh like yours so that he might die for your sin. Mine. He restrained his glory on the cross so that he might pay entirely for every sin that you have and will ever commit. So that you could be right, accepted, forgiven by him. The law and the prophets, the voice of God, even his own glory bear witness that he is the son of God. Believe today and marvel at King Jesus. If he displays the glory of God in his looks, if his actions reflect what God does. And if he's even identified by the voice of God himself, Jesus must be God. And if Jesus is God, every one of us needs to listen. Every one of us needs to hear his voice, hear his words, repent, and believe. Here today we are going to have a time to respond. A time to respond to the glorious King Jesus who has displayed himself in unquestionable ways about who he is. This time is for you to respond however the Lord is impressing upon your heart. 
Perhaps you need to pray there in your seat about your relationship with God. Perhaps for the first time the gospel is making sense to you. Or for the first time you're seeing the glory of King Jesus for who he truly is. I call you to turn from living life on your own way. Hear the words of Jesus. Come follow. I'm going to be here at the front. I'd love to pray with you whatever it is in your life. Whatever it is today. You come. And let us trust him and follow him together. Our musicians are going to come back up and lead us in a song here in just a moment after we pray. Father, thank you for the glorious truth of who Jesus is. Father, thank you that Jesus willingly humbled himself, wrapped himself in our skin, and came down. And he was made like us, that he might be our sacrifice and bring our forgiveness. Father, thank you that Jesus died for me. Father, I pray that every person in this room would hear the voice of Jesus, listen, and follow him. Lord, guide us now as we respond to you. Move in our hearts. Give us eyes to see the glory of Christ that we might be changed. It is in that glorious name, King Jesus, who makes our access to you possible. 